Thank you and welcome to the Center for C-SPAN Conversation with Brian Lamb featuring President Mitch Daniels. I'm Andrea Langrish, the Managing Director of the Center for C-SPAN Scholarship and Engagement, also known as the CCSE. This conversation event is part of the CCSE National Research Conference. And we are excited to welcome our conference attendees and presenters here with us tonight. <laughs> We're also pleased to have with us President-elect Meng Chang, who will be stepping into the role of Purdue University President January 1st, 2023. Also joining us are Provost Jay Ackridge, <laughs> Vice Provost John Gates, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts, David Rangold, <laughs> Dean of International Programs, Michael Brzezinski, oh. <laughs> Head of the Brian Lamb School of Communication, Dr. Mary Fran Matson, <laughs> Head of the Department of Political Science, Cherie Maestas, Head of the Department of History, Fritz Davis. <laughs> Head of the School of Languages and Cultures, Jen William. <laughs> and our very own faculty director of the CCSE, Dr. Robert Browning. <laughs> In October of 2012, then President-elect Mitch Daniels and C-SPAN founder Brian Lamb sat down for their very first conversation. Over the next a decade, President Daniels oversaw an unprecedented freeze in student tuition that has continued to unchanged since 2012. President Daniels expanded opportunities for public and private partnerships and helped increase investments in research and innovations leading Purdue to consistently rank in the top 10 of the most innovative universities. Now, 10 years later, President Daniels and Brian Lamb are coming together for one more very special conversation. Please join me in welcoming President Mitch Daniels and Brian Lamb. Good evening, everybody. Mr. Daniels and I are going to talk for just a little bit, and then we have our fabulous students on either side. They're going to ask some questions. I want to start with a very serious question. President Daniels, how many grandchildren do you have? Seven. <laughs> Seven, and we, uh, we're hopeful the production line is not completely shut down. The, the really important question is, what do they call you? Yeah, uh, I'm uh, <laughs> Papa, which don't ask me where it comes from. Apparently, no one's allowed to be called Grandpa or Grandma anymore. You know, my wife was very touchy about it. It's Mimi. <laughs> uh, you know, it didn't matter to me, but that's, that's what came out. And uh, it got, I think the first one came up with it and it got handed down. Uh, you know, that's fine. Well, What's your favorite speech that you've ever given? CPAC, um, 2011. What was it about? It was um, about my view, my view about the future of the country and the threats to the country. It was a, a lot of it was about our national debt, which I continue to think is the single biggest domestic threat the country's ever faced, and it will bring a reckoning that our children and grandchildren will hold us accountable for. It was about that, as well as other, I was at that time, of course, an active member of one of the parties, and it was an appeal to people, to uh, uh, like-minded people, to, among other things, 
I, I try to be a, a more welcoming, uh, more uh, open, more engaging, more friendly in the pursuit of bringing the country together. That was what it was about. And people, you know, still ask me about that speech a long time later, which sometimes that people don't remember one day later. You're going to laugh about this, but you know, I have a favorite speech of yours. Yeah. <laughs> he was just talking. He didn't know I was going to do this. Talking about it backstage. Butler, 2009. Okay. That's on the list. All right. I got to read just a little bit of it. Yeah. Okay. As a generation, we did not tend to live for today. We have spent more and saved less than any previous American. Year after year, regardless which party we picked to lead the country, we ran up deficits that have multiplied the debt. You and your children will be paying off your entire working lives. A little more. Far more burdensome to you, mathematically, we voted ourselves increasing levels of Social Security pensions and Medicare health care benefits, but never summoned the political maturity to put those programs or anything resembling them on a sound actuarial footing. Let me first make plain that we was the generation I'm part of. I was uh, wailing away on the baby boom generation at the time. I, I think I said a few other um, somewhat critical things, like we thought we invented sex and we thought we, <laughs> uh, you know, discovered the environment and so forth. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, I felt that the, the speech, I, I still think, I haven't looked at it in a long time, I still think I would um, say many of the same things. I certainly do about the, some of the public policy issues you just mentioned. That was only part of the speech. But um, um, I, I felt afterward that it was probably a success when I could, I couldn't, I didn't turn around to see if I could feel the scowls from the faculty behind me. But the student body and their parents gave me a giant standing ovation. So uh, I, I decided it was, uh, it'd probably come off okay. This, this next line is for the students here. Uh, in sum, our parents skimped and saved to provide us a better living standard than theirs. We borrowed and splurged and it will leave you a staggering pile of bills to pay. It's been a blast. Good luck cleaning up after us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I did say that. <laughs> I wish I could say I've changed my mind in some fundamental way over the last 12 years, we, or whatever it's been. I, um, I wrote a book a couple years after that expressing the uh, hope uh, that uh, we could summon as the maturity as a society to make decisions for the longer term. I think that is going to be the fundamental test of this democracy. Uh, and, right, and in all the years since, I can't say we've um, we've passed it, quite the contrary. And um, you know, people uh, can keep whistling past the proverbial graveyard, but these, this is not going to end well. You know, I, uh, I wrote a column for the Washington Post a couple years ago. I didn't want to write, but it was, uh, the theme was sort of know when to fold them. And what, what I said was, I've stubbornly held for many, many years to the hope and the obstinate optimism that we would get on top of our long-term fiscal situation and not leave uh, crushing, uh, economy-stifling debts to our progeny. But I, I said in that piece, up until the last couple years, it was possible to say, if we would just get started on some basic reforms, mainly of the so-called entitlement program, that we, we've got time to make it. We, we don't anymore. And so there's going to be a wrenching adjustment at some point, probably involving much higher taxes, which will not have beneficial effects, and, and probably some, uh, you know, there'll have to be some adjustment of uh, the benefit structure. There are a lot of exit interviews being done and legacy interviews. I'm not going to ask him about his legacy. Students might ask him anything they want to. <clears throat> but in case you didn't know it, Dave Bangert, who has done a terrific job with a new newsletter in this town, he's here tonight, did an exit interview that I would recommend to you. Ask the obvious questions, and I'm not going to go over those, but you can find them online. David's put it online 
so that you can just Google it and uh, call it up and get the <clears throat> as good an interview as you're going to find anywhere on this. And b while you're doing it, subscribe to Dave. I get 10%. <laughs> well, if you hadn't... Even though you did, I'm going to insert a, a, a commercial here. I think uh, uh, another unfortunate reality of our time is that local news has collapsed and collapsed in a very swift fashion. Um, you know, when I left my last job, um, right up till the end, when we would have a news event, and we made a lot of news, uh, there would be a phalanx of really uh, seasoned reporters. My friend Sheila Klinker's down front, you remember, it wasn't, wasn't that long ago. On the table in the governor's office, there'd be a host of print reporters. The students in the audience will need to be informed what that's about. <laughs> there were these things called newspaper. And, uh, and, and they were, as it happened, the, the three or four that were the, the longest serving were all women. They were terrific. They had sources. They had historical knowledge and perspective. And uh, they had editors who would, you know, somebody was checking their work and improving it here and there. And that really served the public interest. And that has evaporated in a blink. And if you want to know what's going on in this town, you better, get, you better take Dave Bangert's newsletter. He was the, the lead uh, reporter here in town. He represented the best of local journalism. I used to see it all over the state. It's unfortunately gone, and I don't know if it's coming back. But at least here in, in Greater Lafayette, we got Dave. I got a text last uh, Saturday morning, <clears throat> early, from my friend Robert Browning. Where are you, Robert? He's out there. And all it said was, I know Mitch is smiling now. And I hadn't gotten, I didn't have time at that moment, for whatever reason, to get my Wall Street Journal. I, I, I don't read it online. I have to read it in print. And I now know why you were smiling, <clears throat> if you were. Because when Peggy Noonan was here last week, and uh, I've never seen you happier or more excited than having Peggy Noonan. Instead of me in this chair, Peggy Noonan. <laughs> and then he woke up on Saturday morning, and she starts right out by talking about being at Purdue. So I want to read you back something that she said, a couple of things, and get your reaction to it. You know, first of all, why, did you, why do you like her column so much? She's unpredictable. She's um, uh, incisive. You know, she said to me, I hadn't seen her in a while. We've known each other a very long time. And I complimented her on what she's doing. She told me, she said, I'm feeling old. I said, well, you don't look old and you're not writing old at all. And she said, I thought it was an interesting comment. She said, uh, yeah, she says, thanks. I'm, I don't think I'm any more articulate, but I think I'm deeper. And I think she is. And, and she's a, uh, so you don't know what you're going to see on Saturday from Peggy. It could be, she could be writing about uh, Putin, or she could be writing about why it's a good idea to go to the office and not do everything remotely. And uh, whatever she has to say, it's usually, it's always well put. There's usually a little humor. I think she's uh, one of our finest commentators and I hope she keeps on forever. I can ditto that. I never, it's not, by six o'clock usually on Saturday morning, I've got my copy and I'm reading it. <clears throat> anyway, here's what she said. Purdue has a strong sense of community and its students are quick, affable, and penetrating. She met with 70 of them when she was here. They were worried that our political polarization might prove fatal, that we might lose our democracy. We're seeing a lot of that. They see signs of it. A student asked how Trump supporters can believe after all the investigations and judicial decisions that Joe Biden lost and he won. Would you like to answer that question? <laughs> answer the student's question? Or, the, or, or explain or to us the, why people today think Donald Trump won. Oh, they've been told over and over and over again. and. And, uh, you know, we, I think we all, it's human to go looking for evidence of things we wish were true. I mean, I could cite things from the left, which are, I think are equally absurd. And, 
Um, and, um, you know, there's the candidate for governor of Georgia kept telling everybody she had been had the election stolen from her the last time, as far as I know, still peddling that idea. So, I mean, nobody has a franchise on this. But, um, you know, I do think, um, Brian, you must be noticing the same thing, that the repute of the national media has never been so low as today. And it differs across demographic and political groups, but it's Skepticism is very high everywhere, and I think this contributes. The more the media um, you know, claims X, the more people want to believe Y, and uh, or or, or uh, uh, come to believe Y. So um, I'm um, uh, as bemused as you are that people still think that, but uh, that's because they want to. Favorite, no, not favorite, most important book in your life that sent you in a certain direction or has stayed with you ever since? No, oh, there's some, you know, this is always hard because I've got a lot of favorites. Modern Times by Paul Johnson, I think framed for me um, in a, or filled in all the gaps now, the filled in gaps in my knowledge of why I believe statism is is a scourge and a and a um, an affront to human dignity, and you know the last century has been the, the the century of the totalitarians, isms of various kinds. Every one of them, in the end, uh, not just uh, harmful and demeaning of human uh, freedom and human dignity, but in the end, murderous. And so uh, that certainly was one. Hardly the only book I ever read on the general subject, but it, uh, uh, just an awesome, uh, awesomely informed and and, uh, and a well-written book. There was a congressman, John Dingell, mm -hmm. you probably met, Democrat from Michigan, and when he was chairman of a committee, or even after he became after the Republicans took over, he had a, a rule that when he was had a witness before him, he would say, "I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions." And I want a yes or no. And I'm not going to do that to you, but I would ask you to keep the answers short because I have about seven of these things I want to ask you about. Oh, yeah, yeah. Lightning round then. All Lightning right. round. Yeah. And, and here's what it is. I'm going to name the different places you've been. Mm -hmm. And I want to get you to tell us something about that quickly that you took away from it. Fair, fair enough. We'll start with Dick Luger. Integrity. Work ethic. I was asked in, a, in the last political debate of the last campaign I'll be in uh, to, to uh, name one person who made an imprint on me. I picked him. I said he was the whole package in public life. Brilliant intellect, uh, iron integrity, and, uh, and uh, total work ethic. And so, yeah. You ran the Hudson Institute, which was in Indianapolis, but mm -hmm. is now in Washington. Mm -hmm. Think tank. Contrarianism. Think perpendicular. If the conventional wisdom has come to a certain conclusion, it's almost certainly wrong. And uh, uh, they were brilliant, quirky, eccentric. I was so lucky. It, 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 it definitely shaped my thinking. I could have picked maybe an early Hudson book. They had humble titles like The Next 200 Years. <laughs> but they saw things that, when, that you know, they got scoffed at, you know? As people like to say today, why, that's settled or the consensus, you know? And they said, no, look out for Japan, where everybody thought they were just never gonna see more than little transistor radios. They, put, they came out with a book in the early 80s, everybody's standing in gas lines, the coming oil boom, you know? <laughs> they were right about not everything, but by, by being willing to, as I say, think in contrary ways and question what everybody else is saying, uh, they were very frequently right, and that, was a great lesson to, to me at that age. I think if I remember right, you had four years at running a major section of Eli Lilly. Was yeah, it? I was there the longest section of my life. It's always interesting to me, you know, giving a talk somewhere or doing something that people sort of tediously go through your bio. Then they skip the longest and to me the most important years I ever spent. And, and when I got asked, um, uh, have been asked many times, so you had these different jobs, what helped you the most? you know, in public office or here. I always say the years in business 
being measured every um, day, every week, and having to uh, drive for constant improvement uh, so that the enterprise could thrive. I mean, those four years out of the 11 I was there were incredibly formative because I won't, I'll spare the details, but it, they were very difficult years for the company, and I was in charge of the heart of the company. If we didn't grow, the company wouldn't, and so, it, um, and they were, uh, I, I learned a lot in those, probably more in those four years than any comparable period. Ronald Reagan. Think big. Um, and don't sweat the small stuff. Think big. Um, you know, Reagan said, I've quoted so often to students who ask uh, questions uh, about their future. Uh, he said, uh, some people seek high positions to be something. Um, others seek it to do something. You know, he was one of those. He had utter serenity. You covered him. Utter serenity. People could make fun of him, you know, his age or claim he wasn't you know, mentally up to the job. He'd make jokes about it. it. didn't bother him at all. He was always focused on the goal. Um, yeah, I know you asked for short answers, but I'll give you a little illustration that um, I had friends. You know, I, I obviously my first sentence in the federal government ended in 1987. And we came home, we wanted to bring the girls home, raise them in Indiana, best move we ever made. And uh, I had friends though that stayed and wound up in the Bush 41 administration. And when it was over and they had lost, somebody in the New York Times asked a friend of mine, what was the difference between the two administrations? And he said, in the Reagan White House, we got up every morning and we knew what the job was. Cut spending, fight taxes, fight Russians. I mean, lower, uh, cut spending, cut taxes, fight Russians. And he said, we never, it was in the air, but he said it wasn't like that in the Bush years. The, the, the goal, the compass wasn't as clear. One of the agencies and most important in town is the Office of Management Budget. Most people have no idea what it does. You ran it for a couple of years. What was your takeaway? Well, I left that job saying, I, know, I now know more about your federal government than any citizen really wants to know. And most of it wasn't very good. Um, no, it was an enormously uh, interesting and fulfilling thing to do. Um, you know, I, I got a call. Uh, I was quite happily uh, engaged at Eli Lilly and Company, we were talking about. And I got a call from the people in charge of the transition, and they asked about They said, why don't you come into the new administration? And they mentioned a job, which was, I said, no. I said, you can get somebody much better for that. Wouldn't be my long suit. Thanks for asking. They called back the next day and said, well, what about OMB? I went home and told Sherry, well, now we have a problem. <laughs> They're asking about the one job they've got because it's the only job that sits at the White House but works with every department of, every cabinet department, every agency. And I had seen how it could be used to try to bring about more effective government you know, people think about the budget, and yes, that's a big deal, but it also has the office, when it's used, which is not in every administration, which reviews regulations. And uh, when it's following the law, applies cost-benefit analysis. You know, this great idea, this new rule that some agency has, maybe it will do some good, but what's it gonna, will it do more harm than good? And it uh, also has, the opportunity to try to foster better management of government, which is the orphan assignment, and uh, we tried hard, but I can't say move the needle much. This is not a legacy question, but it's the same, and along the same lines of Purdue. Hmm? What do you take away from Purdue personally? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, immense pride in the people of this place. Um, to me, it was a, if I hadn't seen it, uh, having a different character and a special and a special opportunity for service at the time, I, I wouldn't have taken the, the job was the last thing I had on my mind. By, by opportunity, I mean um, our ability, although we 
want to excel at everything we do, our ability to really contribute to the national need, which was urgent then and is seen as urgent now, to produce a technologically adept you know, young talent, um, and which, which we're doing now um, uh, even beyond, well beyond what Purdue's always done. And by special character, I just mean, a, I thought, a, a center of gravity that was, that was more serious, more scholarly, more purposeful, you know, um, and, um, and, and more committed to the academic enterprise in its, in its pure form, which is the pursuit of truth, than what we see at far too many uh, schools, uh, um, many, many of our sister schools. It's why they're losing students and we're gaining in my opinion. Time to go to the students. One last question as they get ready to ask a question of you. Would you rather be called my man Mitch or the blade? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm pretty partial to, I mean, the same person gave me both nicknames. You may recall this. I do. It was the... Um, Next guest you're going to have on this stage. Uh, the last guest will, I, will, I will welcome. Yes. Uh, and then the... Uh, the people who talked me into running for public office adopted that. Uh, I'd have to say that one. It, to this day, people use it, and I just it's it uh, it was everywhere, you know, for a long time. And I don't know if it's the alliteration or what it was, but uh, people yell it out of crowds, and um, so I yeah I was kind of fond of that. This has been a softball version of the interview. Yeah, we go right over here. I'm Abigail Mullins, um, and I'm a senior in political science and anthropology. Um, my question for you is, how do you foresee civic engagement programs and liberal arts programs changing on campus after your retirement? I hope they get bigger. I want them, I've always wanted that. The, the, the College of Liberal Arts is bigger now than it was. It was, it had suffered some declines. I think they've made a lot of changes under, under Dean Ryan Gold that have helped there. Uh, and the Cornerstone program, which is an innovation of the last few years that I'm very, very proud and have a little paternal feeling about, has been a, not a, a huge success, not only here, but as you may know, was a, a, uh, noticed and embraced by the National Endowment of Humanities, which has put up a lot of money to propagate it to other schools. Stanford, I think, for example, and others are now using it or a close facsimile. So your college has not only, I think, uh, distinguished itself here on campus, but, but uh, elsewhere where people, I think, at least in places, are realizing that uh, there's a lot of virtue in the greatest things that have been said and written. And uh, part of the growth of a, of a young uh, talent ought to be to be exposed to those things. So yeah, uh, the new business school, I'll finish with this, the new business school, which the board has decided will be the next big uh, venture for Purdue, is going to have at its a liberal arts core. Why? Because number one, young people uh, planning a business career should leave here proud of that and, and understanding if they do it well and with integrity, they'll make the world better. And two, we hear from businesses all the time, boy, you're, you're, your graduates are smart. They can read an income statement, they can design, they can run a spreadsheet, but it'd be nice if they could write two sentences in a row. <laughs> so liberal arts, you know, big, big thing for me and, not, and never let anybody tell you that, that strength and growth in the liberal arts isn't um, fully compatible, in fact, synergistic with a STEM education, which you know many of your classmates chose. All right. Good evening. Um, my name is Avik Patel. I am a senior studying political science from the Chicago area. Mm -hmm. And my question is, as the leader of our university. How have you dealt with criticism from Purdue, from the Purdue community and beyond? And what was the most difficult part about it? Yeah. Well, thanks, uh, Avi. And, and by the way, welcome from Illinois. I, I generally greet your Illinoisan uh, students as refugees, and we're happy to have you here. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I've been asked uh, that question that I, I think I mentioned earlier. So you've done these different things. What uh, what's the most important uh, uh, experience you had? What's the most important uh, asset that helped you in this job? And I usually start by saying scar tissue. You know, I learned, in, particularly in the last job, that uh, 
uh, if you occupy a position of some responsibility and you'd want to do something with it, actually make some change, uh, criticism is axiomatic, it's automatic. Robert Kennedy said, all progress depends on change and change always has its enemies. Any change you bring will discomfort somebody for some reason. They'll, they'll, they'll worry that it's going to um, maybe uh, depreciate their credentials or something. And um, I just learned some time ago that it's futile to try to run around correcting. You know, that people will say things that are completely untrue, unfair, maybe even malicious, and you just have to accept that as a cost of, of, of doing business. And so uh, I've probably been, first of all, there hasn't been very much. I can't, the, the goodwill that I have felt in this job is a hundred to one. Uh, the, uh, you know, any uh, harsh things or critical things that have been said. Um, so, you know, I generally start by acknowledging there may be a good reason for the criticism and trying to, you know, reason with people. And some, if you can't, get past that, you just have to accept it. I'll give you a, a maybe really good example. When we surprised the campus by um, entering the adult online education business by, by creating Purdue Global, there was a lot of negative reaction. And I understood it because the circumstances didn't, pro didn't permit. We were dealing with a public company. We couldn't announce what we were going to do. So there was surprise, there was misunderstanding, and it was it was understandable. Three or four years later, you don't hear any of that. Um, and uh, people, I, we just had this unbelievable uh, uh, commencement here last weekend. I hope you saw some of this. Over a thousand graduates, we're talking single moms, oh, a majority are, are, were uh, minorities um, graduates, 60 plus percent first generation students people getting a second chance in life, people who didn't come to Purdue at, at your age, most of them started and didn't finish somewhere. And that's a noble mission. And everybody I know on campus embraces it now. But the criticism was very severe at the time. And, and I, I had to start by saying, I understand where it's coming from. Now let's talk about it. James. Greetings, President Daniels. Um, my name is James. I'm a communication and political science major from Munster, Indiana. I'm a junior. Uh, and I, I had a question for you kind of uh, into, the, into the future. So uh, very few people get to serve as a university president, and even fewer get to serve for as long as you have. So I'm curious how your unique perspective and, and experience uh, can give you some foresight into the challenges that universities might face in the future. Well, James. Um, I'll start by saying that I have probably turned down, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 invitations to go speak somewhere about higher ed for every one I've accepted. I've taken the position that what we've tried to do here at Purdue University, we think fits us, our mission, uh, but we're not preaching it to anybody else. And I think I'll remain very guarded about that. Now. Uh, there are some, I believe, shortcomings in higher ed. Others have, they've all been fully documented. I'm talking about things like, like the stifling of dissent and, and free, uh, freedom of inquiry. Um, that really deserves to be uh, examined and talked about, and, and, and I have from time to time. The, the, the need to, for proven value, you know, I was on some interview within the first year or two, and um, they asked what, what we're trying to do here, and I said, I guess maybe we had just announced that first freeze of tuition, which was a big deal after 36 years. And I said, well, higher education at the highest proven value. And I think that I have not found a better way to collapse our goal or the, what I think other, many other schools have struggled to, to deliver than highest proven value. I think Purdue delivers that pretty darn well, and I think uh, that should remain a central goal. 
Hi, uh, my name is Allison D. Hi, I'm a senior studying history and law society. I'm originally from Zionsville, Indiana. Mm -hmm. um, my question for you today is what are the biggest challenges you see the university facing after your departure? Oh, Allison, it's going to be all straight up from here. Uh, <laughs> we've got a great new president, a great team of academic and administrative leaders, which I hope and I have certainly encouraged them to, you know, stay together and keep keep moving forward. Um, I think that uh, the, the challenges I just mentioned will remain. Can we be a place, I hope an exemplary place, that not only uh, protects academic freedom, freedom of speech and dissent, but promotes it? Um, uh, and uh, I, I, I see every evidence that we can and will. And it'll be a, every year, it'll be an annual a challenge, especially given you know, inflation that is now broken loose in the country. It'll, it'll be an annual challenge to keep um, uh, addressing the value question. And I never have spoken about this subject without emphasizing the numerator as much as the denominator. If the denominator, yes, everybody's focused on the fact that we've held the, you know, we've actually lowered the cost of attendance tuition, room, and board. But that's not the goal by itself. The goal is always value. And so we have invested heavily in the numerator. Jay Ackridge here just pre pre uh, presided over the biggest expansion of the Purdue faculty in history, 213 net new faculty. Uh, we will never and should never um, pursue affordability in a, in a vacuum. You know, you could, you could deliver a very affordable education if it was a lousy one. And then we're never, that, with that. so that'll be an enduring challenge, but I just, I know we're up to it. And, uh, we, you know, we've proved it for 10 years and 11 years is in the bag, and I bet your mom's already thinking about year 12. Nathan. Good afternoon, thank you both for being here. Uh, my name's Nathan Miller. I'm a junior in economics and political science from Avon, Indiana. Yeah. Um, so my question is this for you. In 2011, when House Democrats left the state, uh, you never activated state police. Uh, you said at the time that every minority, no matter how small, had the right to be heard. Uh, is Indiana a state that still continues to protect minority rights? And do you have any other notes broadly on Hoosier politics these days? I hope we will always be respectful of minority rights here. It's, it's been our tradition um, until the last decade or so um, we had very competitive politics at the state level. And um, at least temporarily, we've, we've moved to a different sort of position. I, I suppose I'm implicit in that, or complicit in that in a way, because it, it was our big wins in 08 and 2010 that, that created the, the, the current situation. But you pointed out in 2011, uh, a, a fairly small minority did attempt to stop a host of reforms that we had proposed for that year and left the state. Uh, no, we, we tried to deal with it, not just with uh, some uh, respect, but with a little humor. Um, I was sitting in a meeting of the uh, National Governors Association that spring, pretending to be paying attention. But in the meantime, thinking about this and uh, I composed a little song uh, mentally to the tune of Won't You Come Home, Bill Bailey. The Democratic leader was named Pat Bauer. Won't you come home, Pat Bauer? Won't you come home? You've been a bad, bad boy. <laughs> you took your public paycheck. You took our reps and went to Illinois. You know, things like that. <laughs> and we played that song on the radio. It caught, it, it, today you'd say it went viral. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we, we waited, we, we made the point, and eventually public opinion, I think, is what persuaded our friends in the Democratic minority to, to come back and, you know, vote no, make your argument, but don't, break, don't try to break the process, don't try to bring it to a halt. And um, that's where sweeping education reforms uh, ending of the inheritance tax, fixing of the unemployment insurance system, right to work law. I'm going to leave out a few. 
all came from. Chad. Hi, President Daniels. My name is Chad Smithson. I'm from Carmel, Indiana, and I'm studying political science and economics. Chad. Um, my question is this. Socrates, that one Greek guy, uh, he notoriously was skeptical of democracy and said that the public was doomed to always vote for the baker peddling sweets that were bad for you and never the doctor giving you your nasty medicine. Do you think that our electorate is equipped to vote for a doctor giving us medicine or are we doomed to always cater to the sweet peddler? Chad, that's a, very, that's a better way of expressing exactly the concern that I talked about <laughs> 20 or 30 minutes ago. It is the test. You know, when I wrote this book, I'm not selling it, it's going to be out of date, I guess. Um, but um, I had an, the only argument I had with the publisher, um, Penguin, the only argument I had was I said, I want to um, write a, a, a short chapter. It won't pretend to be, you know, deep, profound. I'm not a professor of history, but I want to write a chapter. It's going to be called The Skeptics, and it's just going to make the point with a few selected illustrations. I don't think well, Socrates may be in there. I can't remember that. Through the centuries, you know, Americans have been accustomed to free institutions. We think that's the way it's supposed to be. Not that long ago, one of my guests in the lecture series, Francis Fukuyama, wrote a famous piece, The End of History. Free institutions have proven themselves. They're going to sweep, they're sweeping the world. Well, they didn't. Um, the point of that chapter was throughout history, it's, history has mainly belonged to the tyrants and the autocrats and the dictators and the warlords. And this idea of consent of the governed, there have always been people who said, oh yeah, well that can work for a little while. But eventually, human appetites take over, you know, the yearning for a, 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 a the proverbial, you know, man on the, on the white horse, or just the fact that that uh, uh, people in high positions would promise more than they could deliver or choose to pay for. And I do believe it is the continuing, it's going to be the test of our democracy. And I'm hoping, since our generation didn't address it, that yours will. Thank you. How long did you teach the World War I course? Um, every year after the, uh, it started in 14, so seven or eight, eight years, I guess. Why did you teach it? I taught it um, because, uh, first of all, I thought it was, first of all, I taught it because I thought I should have the experience, which I had not had, of, of putting a course together and trying to teach it and see what that was like, just to have a little glimpse of what our faculty uh, do on a daily basis. And I learned it's hard, it's real hard work, and that was very instructive. Um, secondly, because I thought there was a, first of all, um, Aside from uh, Chad and a few others, not enough young people today know much history at all. And that's not a good thing in a democracy. You, you, you repeat mistakes and, um, that you otherwise might know to avoid. And so um, I, I thought that even Americans who are very interested in history don't know much about that. It wasn't really our war, but it changed the last century. It's, a, it's been often described as the the, the decisive event of the, of the 20th century, you know, um, four empires that had been there for centuries, you know, disappeared. Habsburgs and Romanovs and, you know, um, and uh, the Germans and so forth. So anyway, um, uh, I did it. I enjoyed it. Uh, I hope the students did. They, they seem to. Um, but I probably got, the, as I expected to, more out of it than the, any of them. I did ask you 10 years ago on this stage if you'd teach a course in the comm school, and I guess we got our answer. Next question. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Mackenzie Michaelby. I'm from Arlington Heights, Illinois. Um, I'm a freshman here, majoring in economics and political science. Uh -huh. Um, so during the same conversation in 2012, at the very beginning of your presidency, um, you said while speaking to many professors and students that they felt that the most unique aspect of Purdue was the way that community members look to work together across all disciplines. Um, and you said at that point you wish to encourage this during mm -hmm. your tenure. So how do you wish, or how do you um, think that you perceive this goal 
and where do you think opportunities were left on the table? So Mackenzie, you're talking about work, you said working across discipline yeah. and so forth? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I think Purdue, when I arrived, uh, I'll credit uh, Martin Jischke and others for this, already was a step or two ahead in terms of uh, academic, uh, interdisciplinary academics, and I think we've continued uh, to do that. I talk to people at other places and find that uh, they notice this and that they are, I still feel we are far too siloed and balkanized, but we're much better than other places and I think better than we have been. We have more interdisciplinary degrees, uh, you know, the new business school is I going to think th uh, is I going to thrive, I believe, with uh, business slash engineering, business slash maybe other STEM disciplines. I already mentioned the integration of liberal arts into that curriculum. So I think um, here our faculty have been have been leaders, but we can do much, much more. And, you know, I don't think it's um, it shouldn't be unthinkable. We've made changes before that we constantly re-examine the 10 colleges we have and say, are those, are those boundaries still the ones that make sense? Or should we um, uh, break them and mix them together in some other way? I want to say one other thing. I, I'm not sure it's quite what you're getting at, but if you didn't think this was a place where people pull together, just think back to our COVID experience. We stayed open when every peer shut down uh, or, or, or uh, and and we talk about criticism. Back to Avi's question, you know, I got a file this thick. Uh, you know, sincere people, but you know, nearly hysterical. You're gonna kill? Are you trying to kill my daughter? You know, this thing, very nasty things. You're only doing it for the money. You know, that kind of thing hurt. But we made it through, and that only happened as I stressed over and over again, because the entire team, the whole community had to pull together. I never, again, I uh, wouldn't go through it, I wouldn't wanna go through it again, and who would, but I will always be grateful to have been part of a, of a collective effort like that, including most specifically our students who were heroic in, in making certain sacrifices and doing things we, they were asked to do and encouraging each other to do it if you didn't read today, the National so uh, uh, the uh, uh, NAEP Educational Progress Assessment of Educational Progress, confirming that miserable ACT scores we just saw, found that we've lost 30 years of uh, progress, and it wasn't much progress, enough progress in reading and math and so forth with our little ones. Secretary of Education Washington says, "See what the pandemic did." No. Bad leadership did that. People who shut down schools they should never have shut down without good scientific reason. And Purdue didn't do it, and that took all of us. Good evening. My name is Donya Rao, and I'm a junior uh, studying political science and communication, and I'm from Half and Bay, California. Mm -hmm. um, as I stood here, Brian was actively stealing my question, so sorry, Brian. But um, I'm also a student in the John Martinson Honors College, where you've taught that World War I class. Uh -huh. And while I haven't had the chance to take it, um, I wanted to ask, beyond the content that you covered um, about World War I and its impacts, what value have you seen, and what impact has, had that has teaching that class had on you? Oh, thank you. Uh, well, I, as I said, it gave me, I, I hope I already had a strong appreciation for the uh, efforts of our faculty, but it certainly underscored that and, 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 and taught me a little more about it. Um, it uh, I think I got better at it as I went along. I, early on, there was so much I wanted to get across to the students because the, uh, the events we were talking about uh, were, that transformed everything about the world. As I said, they changed the maps of the world, but we also spent, uh, for my liberal arts friends, we also spent one whole module on how it changed the thinking of the world. We read poetry and novels and, and, um, and, other, and other literature. Uh, and um, uh, it's, it's, as I went along, I tried to learn to discipline myself more. Don't try to get it all across. Uh, as, as one uh, faculty member advised me, try to do enough that the students might want to go learn the rest on their own. Just get them, try to get them interested enough. So I got better at it 
and uh, but it, it certainly deepened my appreciation for what your teachers um, put into into it, and I hope you appreciate them too. Matt. Hi, President Daniels. My name is Matt Stockler. I'm I from know Fort who you Wayne, are. I'm a junior in political science. Yeah, hey, Matt. Good to see you again, sir. My question is, um, what has surprised you the most during your time at Purdue? Yeah, the food. Because <laughs> I got this question a lot at, at first. Uh, I'll try to give you a serious answer in a second, but, but uh, no, I mean, uh, when I got here, and I've eaten countless meals in the dining courts and so forth, and I just couldn't get over it when I first got here. I, I kept telling whatever students I was sitting with, I mean, you guys don't get it. College food, is this isn't college food. College food is supposed to be all the same and terrible. <laughs> And you guys have 15 choices. You know, to this day, I can't handle our dining course. There's too many, too much selection. I always just, you know, freak out and default to the salad bar or something. I understand. Um, no, um, I, you know, I, I mean, I, I think that um, I was, I hoped to find it, but I'll say I was pleasantly surprised at the purposefulness of you and your fellow students. And the more I saw of other places or learned about other places, the more grateful I have been. Uh, you know, sure, with, uh, as we approach 40,000 undergrads, um, Jay and I frequently say, well, you're going to have a few knuckleheads. But uh, I think the knucklehead quotient here is pretty low. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I used to kid, I'd get somebody I used to ask this a few years ago uh, when it was more um, uh, topical. People say, are you having uh, student unrest problems at Purdue? I go, oh, yeah. yeah, are we ever? I said, I got a petition on my desk. This is true. I got a petition on my desk right now from 1,200 students who are irate that we're closing the Hicks Library at midnight because they're not done studying. <laughs> I said, if that's not bad enough, the, the leadership of the Rifle and Gun Club is all over me because we don't want them to fire off lead ammo, ammo in the armory anymore. <laughs> So, you know, not to make light of in, uh, too much of, of any of that, but uh, I, I just have felt, uh, I sensed it, but I had to be here to see it, that our students, and by the way, they're very much encouraged and, and uh, insisted on, I think, by our faculty, are here for serious study and applying themselves pretty seriously. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, what we want, that's what we want to be. Hi, President Daniels. My name is Will Courtney. I am a sophomore studying political science and media mass communication. Mm -hmm. uh, my question for you today is about student loan relief. Uh, yeah. Recently, President Joe Biden offered student loan relief up to $20,000. Oh, excuse me. Um, my question for you today is about, do you expect more student lo loan relief to come from the federal government? And if you do, what do you think the effects of that is gonna be? Well, I hope it doesn't come at all. I hope that it's headed off either by some uh, uh, epiphany on the part of the administration or um, um, more plausibly, I guess, by some court that decides that no president of the United States of any party, any time, should have the authority at a stroke of the pen to spend $600 billion. Article one's pretty plain about where the power of the purse is supposed to be, and you political science students didn't mean me to tell you that. I think it is, uh, and I'm not telling you anything I haven't said in print and elsewhere, uh, I think it's one of the most pernicious uh, public policy steps I've ever seen. I, I find no redeeming qualities to it. It is, uh, first of all, it is regressive. Uh, it, is, uh, it, it rewards people who don't need it uh, more than people who uh, you know, putatively do need it. Um, it is uh, incredibly unfair, which I feel acutely here. 99 plus percent of Purdue graduates Pay, have historically have paid off their student loans. Well, you know, what are, what are we to say to them when suddenly some other folks are let off the hook? Um, and um, it is a fiscal disaster on top of many others. I, I'm returning to that subject for the third time, so I won't belabor it. But several hundred billion dollars more debt, which, by the way, note the irony, some of these young people may be happy today that they get some of their the money that they freely borrowed, forgiven. Um, but uh, they're going to get the bill, and you will too, even though you will pay off, I'm sure, any student loan that you take out. Uh, I think it's a terrible moral lesson to the country. 
you know, that you know you don't live up to your obligations. So, um, uh, other than that, I have no problem with it. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Sophia Rivera. I am from Chicago, Illinois. I'm a sophomore studying political science and professional writing. And my question for you is, is there any advice or anything that you wish to leave the current student body with as you depart from your role as president? One, th one thing for sure, Sophia, is they should emulate you by studying writing. Um, here's something I learned in that. Uh, remember, honors college class. Uh, it was. Uh, one year I was 40, and then I realized since I was grading all the papers and all the exams and everything myself for the learning, which my faculty friends thought was humorous, you know. How many, how many TAs you got? I don't have any. You know, they think, what are you thinking? Well, what I was thinking is I should learn this work by doing it. Well, um, so 30 to 40 students, brilliant students. I, some of them are already on, by now on their way to great careers as you know, doctors and scientists and engineers and business leaders and so forth. Uh, hard to find one of them who could write worth a lick. I wrote a Washington Post column about that. And I heard from English teachers and other people all over the country said, yes, you know, what is with this? So one, one piece of advice I would give is whatever else you're doing, whatever, whatever you're studying, Read, try to read. It's hard to write excellently if you haven't read any excellent writing. And so, whatever interests you, I always encourage uh, biographies. By the way, here's another piece of gratuitous advice. But people, you know, it, people say, "Well, what can I read if I want to become a more effective leader?" And I tell them, "Maybe it's me, but I have never really found one of these how-to books that I thought was very valuable." You know, there's 20 of them on every airport and newsstand. But biographies of great people, men and women who did important things, um, you know, seeing what, how they handled challenges, what, what, what they did that worked, what they did that was a mistake, uh, is, is another thing I would, cert I would strongly encourage. And by the way, a well-written history is, is pretty fun to read. It's, you know, a lot of good stories in there. Hi again, President Daniels. It's Shy Robinson again. Oh, um, Shy. You're not very shy, but uh, thank goodness you're not. Wow, well, that's the first time I've ever heard that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you don't know, I'm a junior. I'm a double major in political science and brain and behavioral science. Um, and I'm from Fort Wayne. So one of the pieces of advice that I first got when I was a freshman here was from the Career Center, and it was to be memorable good. Um, and people's, you know, their impression of you. So what have you done personally to make Purdue a memorable good experience for its students? I'm not the one to ask. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd like to think that, that um, in one way or another, everything we tried to do here started with the students. How to make um, the, um, the education, as I kept talking about, more valuable. Uh, we've talked a lot about rigor. Um, some of our students have told me they wish their classes weren't so rigorous, but I say, no, that's what you want. You want to be pushed and challenged and stretched. And that's been part of Purdue's reputation, and I hope we don't lose it. I've surfaced this with our faculty on more than one occasion. Obviously, you know, affordability. Um, we want people to leave here, as, as now almost two-thirds do, with no debt at all, so that the uh, previous question is moot in their case. Um, uh, you know, I hope we've, I put this last, but I hope we've made it uh, in marginal ways a little more fun than it might have been. We've tried to have fun with things, whether it's uh, sporting events or other things. And uh, that, for all my, uh, um, you know, preaching about purpose and studying hard, this, this needs to be a part of the Purdue experience too. And I think it has been, but. Uh, President Daniels, uh, 10 years ago, I asked you a question. You weren't particularly happy with it, but I have to come back to it again just for the fun of it. Yeah, fun for you. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know what Whitaker Chambers said in the early days of Meet the Press? He said, uh, having just been grilled on there, he said, fun for the boys, but death for the frogs. <laughs> I'm the frog here, so go ahead. <laughs> Whitaker Chambers' granddaughter worked for us for really, yeah, and his son, 
I, who also worked for his, anyway. His book Witness could have been an answer to your question yeah. about what book. Here's the here's the question. Uh, Ten years ago, I said to you, Mr. President, the football coach here at Purdue makes 1.2 million dollars. Uh, good old days. And. <laughs> And at the time, the Big Ten Network was coughing up $24 million. Today, the football coach makes $5.1 million, mm -hmm. and the Big Ten Network's coughing up close to $50 million and on to $70 million in the next few years. Why are we spending this kind of money on sports? The market wants it. Uh, it um, you know, it's hardly the biggest change that's happening to college sports right now. College sports is becoming, at least at certain levels, professionalized. Before very, you know, we're already, uh, it's not just the uh, name, image, likeness that you hear so much about, although you have these talented young players literally receiving five digits, six digits, seven digits of money just for signing up at the right place. And, um, but we're now under court order. We're paying players. And that's only going to go up. You know, I think in a short time you're going to have in um, much college sports what amounts to professional teams sponsored by the um, sponsored by universities and uh, probably unionized. Um, that's been the goal of those pressing for you know, for uh, payment of players, and it will be the only way you can get any rules. The, the antitrust laws prohibit the NCAA, or as far as I can tell, any conference or anybody else from trying to put any limits on all this. So, you know, uh, coaches' salaries, ballooning costs like that were a propellant of that, I believe, because it was, was, people made a perfectly just case. Wait a minute, you're paying these adults this, the people who are putting the folks in the seats aren't getting any of it. Um, so uh, that's where it's headed, and I, uh, uh, what I worry about a lot, if that has to happen, I think the world will go on and it'll be entertaining. It'll be very financially successful. TV contracts, much more important than people in the seats even. Uh, what I worry about is all the smaller schools that won't be participating in that. You know, how do you keep the tennis team? How do you keep the wrestling team? How do you keep the, you know, girls soccer team going uh, when, um, all the money goes in another direction. When I was in school, Tim McGinley was an all-star on the basketball team, and he always said to me, I, th I should have been paid. <laughs> yeah. Well, I got just one thing. When I'm sure I answered that question. I remember you asking me that athletics question, and I said at the time, there are three things that, as far as I can tell, Purdue does, I hope we always do, whatever else happens, and that was high standards of conduct. Can't have one set of rules for the star receiver that it doesn't apply, you know, to, to any of the students who just spoke. Um, a, a student athlete has to mean it. I always say real students taking real classes, getting honest grades, violated all over the world of Division I, but not here. And finally, pay for yourself. Don't ask us to tax the 98.5% of students who can't make it on, unfortunately, onto one of our varsity teams you know, so we can have the eighth set of uniforms. And uh, Purdue does those things. I hope it always will, whatever other changes come. You get an A for remembering exactly what you said 10 years ago. <laughs> Hi, my name is Brenna Walters. I'm a junior studying finance and political science, uh -huh. and I'm from New Albany, Indiana. And my question is, have any of your views shifted during your time at Purdue and why? Well, Brenna, uh, first of all, my wife's from New Albany. Are you a bulldog or? No, I'm a pioneer a, from Providence. Oh, from Pro Clarksville, Providence? Yes. Great school. But you're not a super hit from Floyd Central. No, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> He's showing off now. <laughs> I've been to a lot smaller places than that. <laughs> uh, the answer is yes, of course. And I hope they always do. If, you, if, if you're not, um, if, if your views stayed ossified and frozen, I don't care what the subject is, you know, if, if for 10 years, then you probably haven't listened enough, thought enough, talked to enough people who disagree with you. Um, I'll give you a, maybe one of the biggest examples. When I got here, um, it was the 
general direction. I thought it was we should go further in the direction of becoming more selective, more exclusive, um, smaller student body. Why? Not for bad reasons necessarily. The, the, the graduation rates, which are a lot higher now, but still aren't high enough. You know, the, the, the idea was, well, if you, if you um, took fewer students, that you'd have fewer of them um, you know, fall out before they finished. But I wasn't here very long before I realized that's, that's wrong, that's backwards, that's not Purdue. We gotta find a way to do both. We gotta find a way to attract better students, graduate higher percentages and more. We're here to expand educational opportunity, and we have. So 28,000 undergrads to 38,000 headed for 40. Uh, not, we have 12,000 graduate students, by far the most we've ever had, and we have 35,000 plus Purdue Global students that I talked about, those, those, you know, those adult learners who uh, until an opportunity like that came along, thought they'd missed the boat forever. So there's a, there, there's a big one. Uh, and, uh, but you know, I've, I've lamented elsewhere uh, that we, we're, in a, we've, we're in an era where people just can't admit they're wrong, ever. And uh, you know, Lord uh, Keynes, who um, I think was wrong about a lot of it, there's economics, but he said a very smart thing one time. When I find I'm wrong, I change my mind. What do you do? And I wish more people asked that question. We, uh, we've got one more student question. Raymond. Hi, President Daniels. Hi, Brian. Uh, my name is Raymond. I'm in uh, political science and economics. Raymond. Uh, I've talked to you once before, actually, for the yeah. C-SPAN student community. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so. It was about the privatization of all of your public assistance program. But uh, yeah. take from that is they did a good job balancing the state budget, uh, budget as a governor. Oh. And I think you did a good job balancing the budget here as well at Purdue University. But my question for you is something we already kind of touched on. I think one of your biggest policy um, program that you installed at Purdue is obviously the frozen tuition for over a decade. So I want to hear you talk about some of the positive effect of that, like the opportunity created but also some other things that kind of affected both from like out of state uh, students, international student, or the largely increasing uh, incoming student body every year and a little bit of a housing crisis that uh, you kind of created on campus. Well, um, let me just say that we had, I, I, crisis, which is an overused word anyway, I don't think applied at all. I mean, we had a, we had a crunch last year. We, nobody was happy about it. It came because of a startling, um, uh, a surprisingly high percentage of out-of-state students accepting our offer. I've said so often that I learned in business, I really learned in government, uh, to be very leery and, care and cautious about models. They're only as good as, you know, what goes into them, and most of them, uh, you have to accept that they, they're going to miss by some reasonably uh, wide error bar. I had been amazed at the precision of the Purdue and admissions and enrollment office modeling over time. But that one year of uh, 21, um, uh, there was a, like a two point something percent miss. Uh, they, they were right about the Indiana students, they were right about the international students, but the students from like so many of the questioners, Illinois, California, and these other places, uh, we had a surge, so we had to scramble big time. But you know, our folks did a great job. Uh, we were we were square within I don't know two, three, four weeks. Um, and uh, let me just say this: I would not have wanted to turn those students away because we had to inconvenience one or two percent for a short time. Um, but we tried this year. We were much more careful, and uh, the uh, acceptances went out in a couple stages specifically so we wouldn't um, repeat that situation. Um, you know, um, there's no question now, we have years of market research that tells us that two things that have helped, I think the number one reason that young people say they come to Purdue is academic quality and our reputation, which I, I believe is um, you know, grown. But then, uh, the reliability of costs, the, the 
the fact that you're less likely to get socked with an annual increase or a bad surprise has, is showing up. And frankly, the fact that we, the way we handled the pandemic compared to other places they looked at. And so I, um, when people say, gosh, how do you all keep this going? Sure, economies, we look all the time for ways to, to, to be a little, uh, to be cautious with, um, with our, the dollars that don't go right to our core mission of teaching and research. But, you know, a bigger student body has been a huge factor in, in enabling it all to hold together. Thanks. Just a couple quick things. Uh, in some ways, you won't like this phrase, in some ways, you've lived a double life. Well, you've been the president of Purdue University and people here see you on the university campus. And they listen to you and all that. We that live Some in, of them. We, we, we that live in Washington have seen your other life. Mm -hmm. And that is the Washington Post very often 57 times mm -hmm. columns that you've written in the Post. And the reason I mention it this way is because you've been able to continue to talk to Washington. Why did you do it? How did you do it? And how much of it yeah. was your love of writing? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put that, I mean, I, I wouldn't put that on the list because it, it, it's been, um, it's been a, a chore, but I'll tell you the story. I mean, um, first of all, I, I felt from the day I said yes to the job, said to so many of our students, in any job you take on, the first question you should ask yourself is where can I add some value? You know, what, what, are they, what does this organization expect me to do? And is there anything I can do that adds, for some reason, adds a little extra value? So one thing I thought I could identify was, by the good luck of having led these other lives, I knew you and I knew a lot of people. And uh, uh, I could, I thought, if I did it in the right way, I could bring, bring a lot of attention to Purdue and that would uh, elevate our visibility and I hoped our reputation. And so I've tried to take advantage of those opportunities. That's what bringing big name speakers to campus was about. I've made a lot of speeches, uh, you know, in places that uh, somebody else wouldn't, they wouldn't have gotten invited to go. I've taken not all, but tons of you know, cable TV and news programs where they ask me and not the president of, you know, some school in Bloomington or somewhere. And, uh, and, uh, and so the columns were sort of like that. So a wonderful, wonderful journalist that we lost, the late Fred Hyatt, was after me for quite some time. He said, I'd like for you to write for us. I had, you know, he'd, I'd written things in other places and occasionally in the Post. And he, and he said he'd like me to do it. I took a long time, I think it was months, because I took a vow when I came here. I'm, not, I'm never gonna do anything that borders on partisan politics. I, I, I had already stopped doing that at the time of our interview, you know, six months to go in the last job. And so there was that. I said, well, Fred, uh, I'm not gonna write about anything that has to do with that, besides you got a stable of people who that's all they write about. And, um, but I finally decided, and I talked to a bunch of our faculty and others about it. I finally decided, look, if I can put Purdue's name in front of that readership on a regular basis, and if I'm thoughtful about what I talk about, and uh, then um, it, it's worth doing. And I, I think that's been the case. But you know, I try to write about stuff that's in the seams that those people in, there, in Washington don't know about. The Midwest, riding motorcycles you know, uh, college sports. And um, I think we've gotten, you know, to pretty near the end of this experience. And I, looking back, I'm glad I did it. I think uh, it's comp served the, comp the, uh, the intended purpose um, and without, uh, you know, causing uh, Purdue any, ever any embarrassment that I can think of. The thing that most people don't know is the Washington Post is a, known as a liberal paper, but the CEO is the chairman of the Ronald Reagan Foundation, Fred Ryan. All right, last question to you, and then we'll shut her down. What's your favorite all-time word? <laughs> Sherry. <laughs> Thank, 
Thank you all very much. Thank you.